In March of 2020, Sasmita Nayak Bryant was working as a preschool teacher in Washington, D.C. She'd spent eight years on the front lines of the care economy. And finally, things were falling into place. At the time, her kids were four and seven months old. One of the benefits of her job was that she received discounted tuition at the private preschool where she worked. So both of her children came with her, attending school while Sazmita taught in another classroom. You already know what happened next, right? COVID. When COVID happened, we were told we were only closed for two weeks and then we would return after two weeks. But then this was like end of March 2020. And within that two weeks, we got more instruction that we would be doing virtual classes for all ages, except for infants. So I, uh, I taught virtual classes until June 2020. And um, I was laid off. Sasmita remained out of work through the summer. And then in the fall of 2020, she faced a difficult decision. Public schools in Washington, D.C., where her daughter was going to start pre-K, were shifting to virtual instruction. But the private preschool where she taught was reopening in person. Sasmita was offered her job back. First, uh, I really wanted to go back to work. I loved my job. I loved kids. I was very, I am still very passionate about children's overall growth. But at the same time, the virus was on his, in his peak. I, I juggled between choosing my passion versus my family over the virus. It was, it, it, it was a very hard decision for me because we are a two-income family and we live in a city in a neighborhood which is very expensive. And we couldn't survive if we, like my husband and I, didn't work. But having to make the choice of staying home during COVID was something was very challenging first because we didn't have enough resources financially how to support our family. Second, I was so worried and afraid for my children and my family if something happens due to the virus. We have like really nobody, no extended family or no immediate family around. And childcare is something I think I can never (laughs) afford (laughs) in the area. That was not a choice for me. Sasmita was stuck. Give up her job at the preschool and she would lose the only childcare she could afford. But go back to the job and risk her family's health? Who would step in if one or all of them got sick? I'm Julie Kohler, and this is White Picket Fence. This season, we're exploring our country's caregiving crisis and the ideologies about race, gender, families, the economy, and yes, white women, that have blocked public investments in care and led us to a point where so many of us are cracking. If you've listened to this season, you already know my story. I'm a single mom to a now seven-year-old. My son was about to start virtual kindergarten, which required near constant supervision, but I couldn't quit my job. So I would sit next to my son, struggling to write just one email while helping him unmute his iPad or hold up his workbook to show his teacher how he wrote his letters. Every day, I was filled with panic, feeling like I was doing everything poorly, and there was no end in sight. Sasmita, it turns out, had been my son Benjamin's preschool teacher a few years earlier when he was two. She lives in my neighborhood, and we'd see one another from time to time at the park. That fall, at a friend's suggestion, Sasmita and I reconnected. And after considerable discussion with her husband, she decided not to return to her job and to instead care for Benjamin at her home. It was a big decision, one that affected her entire family. When she told me, I nearly cried with relief. I was 
not really looking for any job or nothing, not until things settle down. But then out of the blue, I got this text message from you, Julie. So after getting the text from you, we I mentioned that to my husband, AJ, and we discussed and uh, we decided that it would be a good uh, situation for us, not only financially, but our children, they will have companion, at least one other companion, because they were all in, my five-year-old was in virtual uh, school and she didn't really see anybody. So the choice I made to take over Benjamin was really for Sonali to have a friend but at the same time also it helped me support our family financially. I loved every day we had, every day we look forward to what the instructions would be from the teachers, uh, how the day would go like uh, my husband working from home, <laughs> living in small apartment. It was challenging to have all three kids under one roof and having that age difference with my infant son then now he's an active two and a half year old but it was really fun to see the kids happy they didn't know what is going on in the world at that time they were just happy to be together and it it just it it made my day it, it was such a satisfactory moment for both my husband and me to see our children happy. I would not say it was the happy, happy <laughs> moment through the, it was challenging because all everybody was in different schedule. There was some challenge managing the hours with all the kids and having to work at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. My gosh, it's like a really complex, I mean, the logistics were just insane. I'm getting almost like kind of teary-eyed just having you talk about it, because I think even in my own sort of retelling of the story, you know, I, I, I focused a lot on sort of the need for childcare in order to work. But I think you're bringing up, oh my God, just how important it was for the, the kids to be together and what a difference it made. That was just so meaningful <laughs> from my end. And, oh, my God, you know, the the fun that they, you know, that Benjamin and Sonali had together and um, the play dates they had even outside of, you know, the week. And it, it just that was such a a joy in a, in a period where there wasn't, you know, where it was kind of bleak in other ways. It was. We we were really blessed having having all the kids together, uh, even though it was challenging. They were happy, and that's what mattered to us most. Um, we we adults were going through something, but we didn't wanted them have to go through the same. I will be forever grateful for Sesmita during those months. I genuinely don't know what I would have done had she not brought Benjamin into her home. But the decision also took a serious toll on her. I think during the whole COVID, I was just trying to manage uh, manage through every single day, try and live one day at a time. Personally, I went through many, many challenges, having to provide not only care for my children, my family, but for myself too. I um, never had that five minute break myself or 10 minute break myself. But childcare was something we struggled as uh, parents that we just didn't know who to trust with our children and what to do. It, it, it was hard. It was, from, I think, now that the kids are back to school, my body has it compressed. I think one of the reasons I had fainting is that all the stress we had during the pandemic, it all came at once and it hit me hard. Sasmita is not alone, of course. 
millions of care workers face similar challenges, balancing financial needs and their love for their jobs with their and their families' health and well-being. And as a sign of just how broken the marketplace is, many care workers struggle to find or can't afford care for their own children. The status quo is not acceptable. And one of the most disturbing things about the current system is that it pits people against one another. Parents can't find care and are paying too much for it. Care workers are not being paid enough. How can we break through and work together to build a different system? That is the question. It's what we've been building up to this entire season. It's what nearly every parent has asked themselves at some point over the last year and a half. It doesn't have to be this way. How can we make things better? It requires a new paradigm, one grounded in the belief that the public sector has a responsibility to deliver essential goods and services, to make them accessible and affordable, to pay its highly skilled workers a living wage. We need a paradigm that doesn't divide families into deserving and undeserving, but recognizes that we're all just doing the best we can. And we need a paradigm that sees parents and childcare workers as members of the same team. I wanted to talk to some people who've been getting us there. Dorian Warren is co-president of Community Change and co-founder of the Economic Security Project. A few episodes ago, he talked about the role racism played in blocking public investments in care. Even as that divisive rhetoric was being thrown around by politicians, of both parties, something else was happening on the ground in communities large and small. I like to think about politics um, to, to use, you know, a metaphor as plate tectonics. Think about Georgia, for instance. No one was paying attention to Georgia before last November in a real way. But the organizing that had taken place since the early 2010s by Stacey Abrams and many others was the slow moving tectonic plates. And then, oh my goodness, a political earthquake in 2020 and 2021, two democratic senators from the cradle of the old Confederacy. How did that happen? (laughs) Well, we just saw the earthquake, but we didn't see the plate tectonics. And I think of childcare in the same way. But we actually got approached by some grassroots women of color who were part of organizations that were multi-issue organizations who said, we want to organize around childcare and early learning. And so we said, okay, this is not our, you know, this is not our issue. But they said, but you know how to organize. So, and you know how to build capacity and build power. So help us build out our organizations. And so that's what we've been doing for the last six, seven years. And I think, for instance, of Parent Voices in Oakland, They have been organizing for at least five years before a huge ballot initiative last year, which provided a system in Alameda County, which is where Oakland is, a system of guaranteed early learning and childcare for the residents of that county. And that was a huge organizing win, millions of dollars to go into early learning and childcare. And that only came about from deep organizing, talking to neighbors, talking to friends, keeping the issue alive, putting the issue on the agenda. That's what organizers in grassroots movements do best is to force issues on the political agenda when political elites do not want to take it up. Um, another example would be New Mexico. There's been amazing on the ground organizing in New Mexico with a group there called Olay which has been really pushing the envelope on how to create a state-based system of early learning and childcare that is high quality and affordable for all. And they even have a, I think, a pending constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot next year to enshrine the right of early learning and childcare in that state constitution. It's incredible. Years ago, Dorian and his team realized what was missing when it came to childcare. There was no political movement, no coalition, no base that brought the interests of parents and workers together. So they set out to make it happen. We did listening early on when we were talking to some of the grassroots leaders who kept saying, help us, help us build out a child care movement. And we quickly understood that you couldn't just organize parents that you actually had to do something about the pay of childcare teachers and ensure that providers could 
actually get funded enough to stay in business and provide the high quality services around early learning that parents so desperately wanted. And so we quickly understood you needed three legs to the stool. You had to have parents organized, you had to have teachers organized, and you had to have providers organized. The organization that Dorian leads, Community Change, has helped shift what seems possible when it comes to childcare. And they've united the three legs of the stool, parents, teachers, providers, into a political force. But they weren't alone. Organizations like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, NDWA, have been carrying on the legacy of Johnny Tillman, who we talked about last episode. They've created a feminist movement that actually centers domestic and care workers. Over the last 15 years, NDWA has made real gains that benefited their base, like passing the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights in several states. The legislation gives domestic workers the right to overtime pay and other labor protections. A federal version of the bill was recently introduced by Representative Pramila Jayapal. And yet, NDWA was still struggling to figure out how to have bigger impact, to achieve real political power. Enter Jess morales Ricardo. Jess is a force in the world of caregiving advocacy. She joined NDWA as their civic engagement director and became executive director of their sister organization, Care in Action. Her charge? Build power. And the only way to do that has been by getting political, which means electing better candidates and enacting better policy. We needed to think about all of the different ways that we could wield power. We had done not that much work in political, and we had done almost no work in federal legislative power. And that is is truly what has guided kind of the first five years of our work. How do we fight for dignity and fairness for millions of domestic workers in the United States, most of whom are women of color and immigrant women? And then in particular, in our electoral work, we really work to elevate the voices of women of color, um, women of color candidates, and then also women of color in the electoral process. We believe that if we can get what we call high potential voters, so when they vote, they vote with their values, but often the challenge is getting folks to vote, that they are the ones who can win elections and usher in a new multiracial democratic majority. And I mean, democ- like in the form of democracy, not, not Democrats, um, that, that we think will kind of take us into the future. Over the last few years, Care in Action and other organizations have expanded their work, helping to move those tectonic plates that Dorian talked about. And the result? Well, I need to be honest, it's not where I thought we were going to be when we started this season, or even when we originally recorded this episode a few days ago. You might notice that my audio suddenly sounds a little different. That's because I'm re-recording this portion at home, on the eve of this episode launching. In the original version, this was where I extolled the benefits of the Build Back Better Act, how it would invest $400 billion in childcare and early education, how it would create free universal pre-K for three- and four-year-olds, how nine in ten American families would gain access to affordable childcare. It would be a big shift, the result of 50 years of tectonic plates. But today, it seems, that dream has once again been crushed. On Sunday morning, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, the critical 50th vote in the Senate, announced that he would not support the Build Back Better Act. To those who have fought so valiantly to get us to this point, the news was simply devastating. And for those of us like me, who live in parts of the country where the new COVID variant, Omicron, is surging, and who are having panic attacks over finding ourselves right where we were a year ago with no additional support in place, it feels infuriating. But what I'm trying to stay focused on is those tectonic plates and a feminist movement that has, I believe, transformed our national consciousness when it comes to care. No matter what Senator Manchin does, we are in a moment that looks a lot different than 50 years ago. What's changed? Well, I think 
What we've seen over the last couple of years is that we have kind of the components that were needed to put care work together. You had what I call the protagonists of domestic workers, incredible, amazing, powerful women who were making a case for years and years and years before people were listening with their demands about dignity and respect at work. You have a pandemic that helped people understand why that work was so essential and also gave people an experience that they maybe had never had before of not being able to have care and what the cost of not having care is. Last episode, we talked about the divisions between NOW, the National Organization for Women, and NWRO, the National Welfare Rights Organization. White middle-class women played an outsized role in the feminist activism of the 1970s. And their leadership came at the cost of Black women's experiences. But this time, the movement looks different. I think maybe the easiest way to say this is when we center domestic workers, when we center immigrant women, when we center Black women, when we center, you know, women who are in a gray area of the economy, we are deciding to center the people who have been cut out and marginalized in not only our society, but in our movements. And we are also making the choice to decenter the people who are less affected and center the people who are most affected. And I think when we do that, we are able to see more clearly what the problems are. And then I, I hope we're able to provide solutions that actually fix the problems that we have. And that's really important because immigration, paid family medical leave, you know, good paying jobs, racism. These are some of the biggest challenges that we face in our society. And domestic workers really stand at the center of all of those things. We live at the intersections in the domestic worker movement because we have no other choice. So we live at the intersection of Black feminism. We live at the intersection of immigration and our economy. We live at the intersection of class and the ways that domestic worker employers and domestic workers interact. And all of that is the reality of the life that domestic workers live and the challenges that they face. When we put those women at the front, when we listen to them, when we let them lead and when we actually follow, then I believe that not only will the issues be elevated, but also the solutions that we put forward will be solutions that actually make the change that we need. I've thought a lot over the two seasons of this show about who we center and why. When it comes to childcare, we as parents think a lot about our own situations, how our lives would improve with better support. But I think sometimes we forget that there are thousands of caregivers whose lives are on the line. In my darkest moments, I think I've forgotten that. Part of this process, this unlearning and rewriting of my caregiving journey, is starting to tell different stories, ones that might not center us. And then, We have to go further. We have to fight for something that doesn't just improve our own lives, but improves everyone's. That holds those of us who rely on care workers accountable to them. That builds the solidarity dividend. The idea that by coming together, we can accomplish what we can't do on our own. We're so eager for actual change that it's easy to have seen the passage of the Build Back Better Act as the win. And yes, it would have been historic. But even when passage looked a lot more likely, advocates like Jess saw it as just one step of something more transformational. Our vision is of universal family care that cares from people from the cradle to the grave. And that is good for consumers and for workers because we ultimately believe that will be good for our economy. When we put those things together, you start to be able to see how the care economy becomes a core political issue. And I think that once we are able to move that forward, it will also mean other things. It will mean that Black women are valued in the care space. It will mean that 
the feminist economy will be taken really seriously. It'll mean that women being put back to work will become a priority for our government and our society. So all of these things will start to be true. And when those things are true, I think it opens up the possibilities, um, not only for changing our families, but also for changing our country. We've spent 50 years in a paradigm that's worked against a lot of these possibilities that Jess is talking about. A paradigm that's taught us that we're accountable to shareholders and property owners. But part of NDWA's work is inverting that paradigm and holding ourselves accountable to those who provide the most fundamental service to our nation, care. What does that look like in action? Well, when the pandemic hit, Jess and the Domestic Workers Alliance watched their members descend into crisis. So they shifted their game plan and raised a $30 million fund to provide direct support to struggling domestic workers. To me, it was an incredible moment of learning that when you listen and kind of scrap everything, (laughs) change all of your plans because you are actually being led by the people that you say you are, and you are actually trying to make a difference in their lives, it opens up new doors. I mean, you know, that was a huge moment for our movement And it also was a big deal for many of our workers, some of whom were showing us screenshots of their bank accounts. You know, like we would be on webinars and they would flip their phone around to show us their bank account and it would show literally one cent in their bank account. Women who are making the choice between leaving their kids at home for eight hours a day and their elderly charges who they worried would die if no one went to go see them because they were the only people seeing them in the pandemic. And... I'll forever be so proud of that because I really do, I really saw the power and the transformation that can happen when you let people lead. And what happened was people followed those workers. They gave them their money. They elevated their work. You know, the concept of the essential worker was really born out of some of the work that we did in the domestic worker movement. And I think all of that has helped me see that I really do believe we're only scratching the possibility of our work and of what we can do because I. I believe so deeply in our collective power. The pandemic has really shown me that when we come together, we have the ability to save lives and to change um, individual families' lives and to change our country. But, you know, we have to do that. We have to get up and do that every single day. And it's really hard. (laughs) One thing I don't know that we talk about enough in organizing work is how difficult it really is. It requires you to wake up every single morning and hope against all hope. For me, I find that power in our workers. And when I listen and follow them, it's always right. And I think that everybody kind of needs to figure out who they are listening and listening to and following. When you're clear about who you're accountable to, I think this work gets a lot easier. And not because the actual act of it becomes easier. It's quite still quite difficult, but it the clarity that you need to move forward and the leadership that you need to be inspired by will always be there. We've all been through something profoundly disruptive. It's caused a lot of pain for many of us. Pain some of us haven't really recovered from yet. Over the last few months, we've heard a lot of stories about that pain from guests and listeners. 2020 was probably the most stressful year of my life. Um, I found that my sense of an independent self and identity was completely lost. And because I was working from home and I was still required to work my normal eight hours, um, I would just transition back and forth multiple times a day from being a mom to an employee to a mom to an employee. I don't know that I've ever felt so utterly alone. It's just, it's maddening. It's maddening being a woman in the world right now. You know, I'm a single mother by choice to now there they will be 12 um, year old twins. I was a new CEO, which is pretty demanding. And then pandemic happens. We think it's going to be a couple weeks and schools close and it's me and them. And I um, couldn't do it. They're trying to learn online, but it's weird. And and I'm like in meetings all day at my computer. I felt like I was doing as um, Sheryl Sandberg says, double, double duty. 
This fall, which I thought was going to feel like a big relief, has actually been as hard as the spring when the pandemic started, just in different ways. I now will most likely carry the load of after-school care again. Um, is really scary, and uh, it's a change again, and I didn't realize how much the weight of him being in charge of after-school pickup uh, really lifted um, responsibilities for my sh- for my shoulders that I've been carrying for most of my children's life. They really worry about my parents. I worry about my husband's parents who are in their 70s. I see the, the kind of social isolation of of all four of them. I see that they are becoming more frail. I worry that I can't get to them when I need to, to help provide care. I know that given our current system, I'm going to be the one providing care for them. In 2016, our nanny had to stop working for us and we lost child care for our eight month old daughter overnight. I had to resign from my job and it's been five and a half years since then, but I'm still paying a price professionally and emotionally. I was so ashamed that, you know, I couldn't make this work. I don't think I've processed yet fully what it's what it meant to have a baby during a pandemic. You know, I think about this every day. How am I showing up and doing the labor and sharing in the household labor with my spouse so it doesn't all fall on her? And it's a struggle and I'm struggling with it and trying to do my best. But I just want to name that it's it's a struggle. In this moment, we have a choice. It would be understandable to seek out the familiar, the ordinary, the back to normal. There is an opportunity for those of us with the comfort to do so, to let the pain fade from our memory, to just let the current of the status quo carry us along. But I think, I hope, that we've reached a point where we can't close our eyes anymore and that we use this moment right now to fundamentally realign the systems that have made it so hard, not just for the last few years, but for generations. The fight may look a lot more challenging than it did a few days ago, but it continues. There have been generations of pioneering women who never lived to see the justice they fought for realized. I hope I will. But in the meantime, I'll keep fighting, I'll tell new stories, and I'll remember all the people to whom I'm ultimately accountable. Can you talk about some of the people who care for you? Mommy. Mommy cares Nanny for you? Nanny and Poppy. Nanny and Poppy do. Those are your grandparents? And um, Nady. Nady is ba- a babysitter. Miss Asmita. Miss Asmita does. Know. And what does it mean to care for someone? Be good. Be polite and be nice. Be good and be polite and be nice. Mm-hmm. Try to help people. Yes. Yeah. Try to help people. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's what you have to say about care. Okay. Not well, I'm I'm, I'm really happy that I get to care for you. Like you don't want me to look like that? Like this. Oh, look up here? Okay. That's it for this season of White Picket Fence. Thank you so much for listening. To continue this conversation, find us on social media. On Instagram at WMN.media. On Twitter at WMN Media. And you can follow me, Julie, on Instagram at Julie Kohler Writes. And on Twitter at Julie K. Kohler One. Special thanks to all of our guests and to the team at Clean Cuts Studio. White Picket Fence is a Wonder Media Network production. Our producers are Maddie Foley, Edie Allard, and Taylor Williamson. Executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Special thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Shared Ascent Fund for their generous support for this season.